recording started, which means now I can't uh, say or do anything too stupid. Okay, so let's let's say okay. Welcome back to a very slightly different uh, CMSC three forty one. Um, I'm still working through internet issues. Uh, YouTube. I tried it on a different computer. I basically been doing all the standard things. Um, and this is what I've been doing for the past year, so unfortunately it's kind of messed me up. Um, I'm going to deliver lectures uh, somehow uh, until I get this inter internet issue fixed. Technically, I guess we could always just do... If, if I paid for Nitro on this server, we could actually um, have, I think, the entire class in here. I think the limit is only 25 when... Uh, when you don't have nitro, which is which is stupid. I might ask the department to pay for it just so that, but they'll probably be like, why don't you just use all the other tools? Okay. Anyway, so that's that's the current status of internet, which is uh, internet equals uh, bad. Okay, so I think um, project zero is due tomorrow, right? Um, has everyone finished uh, project zero? And if you haven't finished Project Zero, why not? And if you haven't asked me for help about it, uh, what's going on, right? So make sure you either ask me for help about it. Um, you know, I can I can provide help in this channel. I can create like a secret voice channel where I drag people for officer uh, office sirs office hours. Um, I was watching the impeachment coverage, so I keep the, the word officer is in my head. Um, uh, and then. So yeah, finish uh, project zero, and that's really it. So I'm thinking I'll probably write up uh, homework one tonight. Uh, it's gonna be mostly uh, linked list stuff, uh, maybe some induction. So what I'm gonna do today, uh, my thinking is basically this. Let's see here. I was thinking I was gonna cover a little bit, I'm gonna do like an induction review. So we're actually behind a lecture, and so I was supposed to do the induction review last class, but I'm, I'm just shifting everything back one. I'll probably, once I get all the internet issues solved, I will deliver another lecture, but currently delivering the, the currently scheduled lectures is difficult enough for me to where I am not, I'm not gonna to volunteer to do more because that would be asking just to, to you know, fail. So, okay, so we're gonna do a bit of induction review. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna talk about big O. And then we might start on sorting algorithms, which I think is really like the first real kind of good introduction uh, to big O. And so that's, that's nice. All right, so, okay. I think that's, that's all that I really wanna say about uh, the course structure currently. Um, when I give a homework, uh, you'll have two weeks uh, to do it. And the submission will be on Blackboard. So, um, yep, that's, that's that. Okay. Uh, homework homework is going to be uh, is a mix of coding and theory. So, for instance, you're never going to actually do a doubly linked list on a project because, as it turns out, um, the project is a circularly linked list, right? And it's using some dynamically allocated arrays and all this stuff, this and that. But you're going to tell yourself, but wait, I've been robbed of the opportunity to do a doubly linked list and learn the annoyances of having to insert a node because you have to keep track of the previous and the next, right? Um, well, guess what? I might have you implement like an insertion out in the insertion function for uh, a doubly linked list or something like that. We might do something of that order in the homework. Um, I'm going to, so the homework will involve coding. It's gonna be substantially less than the project and you're not gonna be graded to the same standard because I will be running your code. So it's not gonna be like 
Um, you don't have to comment the thing. You don't have to document it too well. It just has to run and work. Um, so that's really it. Like the homework coding uh, is going to be uh, way more rough and also uh, way shorter, ideally, right? So I'll have you write maybe the insertion function for a doubly linked list, but I'm not going to have you write the entire doubly linked list and test everything. I'll just have you write one function. And if you write that one function, then I think that you had a good enough experience with doubly linked lists that you can probably fill in the rest. And if you don't get that question, then you know that you need uh, no, rough, rough as in, um, I guess I, I didn't say what I meant by rough. Uh, you're allowed, you know, uh, to not comment. Uh, we're not worried so much. We're not going to probably not going to, uh, val grind it. Um, I might val grind some stuff, but like, you're not going to lose huge points for val grind or it's like two out of 10 points, right? Something like that. So it, rough as in, uh, if you don't have to make your code the most absolutely perfect code, I mean, I think, I think the idea of the homework, uh, is that you should learn on the homework, make mistakes, um, uh, you know, kind of figure things out. I mean, if you write something really terrible, obviously you should rewrite it. But if you're writing something that's just like fine, you know, you can, and as long as it works, you can submit it. Um, you know, obviously you should try to make it good, but what I'm saying is that the first time you write a piece of code, the first time I write a piece of code that does a certain thing, and then the second time I write that code, or the third time I write that code, it's always better the third time, like substantially better. So, okay. Um, so in this class, let's, let's begin with the actual stuff. Let's begin. So, um, as I said, it's, it's on Blackboard. Well, I haven't posted it yet. It's going to be on Blackboard. And I'll post it in the announcements. But the formal, I, I guess I'll say this. The formal uh, announcement is always on Blackboard. So once you get that Blackboard email, consider that an official start of the assignment. Um, if I forget to post it on Discord, we can post it on Discord, but the official announcement, um, the unofficial is uh, Discord, etc. So I might post it in multiple places, but the official announcement is always the Blackboard announcement. Okay, so let's talk about induction. So, Sure, let's talk about induction. So what is induction? So I hope most of you have taken CMSC 203, where you supposedly learned induction. And that's like 99% of the point of that class. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through induction a little bit and talk about it. And we're going to discuss maybe two or three examples of induction proofs. And then I might try to do, like, we'll do some inductions live and just show how they work and that kind of thing. So, um, of course, you're like, what, what the heck is he doing? Hang on. I'm looking for some render mathematics PDF. Yes. Okay. I'm going to hide this from you so you don't have to look at the text as a type it, but the tech, I guess you might call it. Okay. So induction is a process, is a proof technique uh, where we prove that uh, basically for all integers and bigger than some start, that a proposition is true. And so if you wonder what a proposition is, right? A proposition is basically a function. that takes, in this case, it's going to take some integer n, and it spits out uh, either true or false, right? That's all a proposition can do. It can only spit out true or false. So um, basically, let's give an example of a proposition. So for instance, let's do the Gauss sum, my favorite 
My favorite, uh... Induction proof, first induction proof, is uh, is usually the Gauss sum. So let me type in the Gauss sum. Again, so the sum from i is equal to one to n of i is equal to n times n plus one uh, divided by two. And let's hope this. Did I do everything correctly? Let's see what happens. It always takes a few seconds to render the first time because it has to load up LaTeX and then it kind of shoves it all the way down here. So, so here is what we're going to prove. And so this is the proposition, right? The proposition, and the reason why this is a proposition is because it has an equal sign and things are either equal or not equal, right? So this is a proposition uh, because it has an equal sign. And that equal sign is either true or false, right? It's either true that this is right, or it's false that it's correct. And so um, there's a bunch of ways to prove this fact. Um, there's some like proofs that use like triangles and kind of cool stuff, you know, much cooler than what we're about to do. Um, but let's just remind ourselves what an induction uh, proof entails basically there's two steps right there's the base case and that's where you prove it true for a certain case now I, I can't really say what that case is because you have to decide for yourself what that case is going to be but it's going to be the first time that the proposition is true it is true so for instance if it's true for n is equal to 1 then you prove it for n is equal to 1 most of the time, uh, you'll do like n is equal to 0, n is equal to 1, n is equal to maybe 2. And I'll show you some examples where you might have to start at like 2 or 3 or something like that. And so let's do the base case right now. So let's, let's say that this time we're going to pick n is equal to 0 as the base case. And so the issue here is that we have to evaluate, well, let's pick n equals 1. And so let me show you the problem with n equals 0, and then maybe you'll agree that um, you want to start with n is equal to 1, or maybe you'll say, well, this is fine. So let me argue why n is equal to 0, I kind of hemmed and hawed for a second. So let's look at it. Uh, I guess i is stuck in there for no reason. We should pull that. Let's see. Yeah, let's try that again. I'll just re-render it. Sometimes it doesn't render perfectly, and I don't know why, but anyway. Here we are. So here's the n is equal to zero case. And so remember what a summation means, right? A summation is a for loop. So basically this is saying for i is equal to one, uh, i is less than or equal to zero, i plus plus, right? Uh, and then we're gonna say like total plus equals i, right? So this is the, yeah, so, so that's the issue here is you look at this this summation here and it says for i is equal to one i is less than or equal to zero i plus plus and you say well does this for loop execute exactly this for loop never executes right the for loop never executes and so the question is what does that mean like mathematically and most of the time what we do is we say that if a summation is something like this and what i mean by like this is that it has a bad set of start and end indices, uh, that it's zero, right? Um, you might say, well, why do we assume it's zero rather than undefined or whatever? Usually you just assume it's zero. It usually kind of works itself out like this. So if we assume that this side is zero, then we see that zero times one divided by two, that's zero as well. So this proposition is true, but you might, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about this, you might think, well, this is, this is a weird case. This is a case that I don't really like because, you know, it's not actually telling me anything. It's it's kind of an exception case. It's relying on something about the um, nature of, of summations and the fact that it's a bad set of indices and all that. So maybe you don't like that one. So let's go to, let's say that you started, can, can't we change i equals 1 to i equals 0? 
Uh, you don't want to do well. You can do that, and then it's also adding up zero, so that's fine too. But I'm I'm uh, I'm talking about this more generally, just because I think that it's good to t say what happens with a summation with a bad set of indices, um, just for the future. Um, let's say that you do this instead. So this is a for loop. Now this for loop is um, this, right? So now the for loop goes from i equals 1 to 1, and now you say, okay, well, it's less than or equal to, so it will include the last index, and so here, this whole thing is just i equals 1, right? So you stick in a 1, and you get 1 on this side. Then over here, you get 1 times 2 divided by 2, so you'll get 1 over here. So both of these are true, right? Right, both of these are true. You only need one of these as your base case. I don't really care which one you pick. Sometimes you'll be, you'll think like, well, this one's too stupid. This one's not a very good base case. This one actually shows the thing working. So this is how you prove a base case. And you notice that we we didn't really, so this is not the induction part, right? The, the induction part comes next. So let's talk about how the induction part works. So now that you've done your base case, we have to do the second part of an induction which is the inductive step. And this is the part that everybody seems to uh, get confused by. So um, let's see if I can not confuse people this time. So how should I think? So I'm trying to think of a new way to explain this. I always try to think of a new way. So basically what you have to do is you have to assume that the uh, formula, the proposition, is true up to some fixed number. And so in this case, we're going to call that number m. Not n anymore. Well, let's let's call it uh, k, because k is, is phonetically different enough from n and m. Um, it's always bad verbally to use the two nasal consonants, because then it gets very confusing. So here, what we're going to do is I'm going to assume, not that it's true up to uh, and for any n, I'm going to assume that this formula is true. And let me show you the formula. The formula is now, it's the same thing as we had before, except I've just replaced all the n's with k's. And so assuming it's true up to a certain k, what we're going to do is, and so this k is a constant here, right? Assume that this k is some actual number. Right, it's not uh, a variable. This is not for all k. This is a uh, specific, like imaginary, or a specific. Uh, I don't want to say imaginary since it's actually a real number, but a specific k that uh, is now fixed forever. Okay, for this proof. So. We assume that this is true for some k, right? So, and so now what we want to do, so this is now our goal. We uh, want to show that it is true for k plus 1. So how do we do k plus 1? Let me show you the k plus 1 step. So what we'll do, we're going to do is we're going to replace k with k plus 1. And so in this case, we're going to say k, k plus 1. And then this will be k plus 1 plus 1, which hopefully we all recognize as k plus 2, but who cares? So this is what we're going to get um, when we do the, and I, I hate how it always puts it off screen. But anyway, here it is. So this is what we are going to try to show, right? So this is what we know is true, and this is what we're going to try to show. So let's collapse this thing into k plus 2 and just simplify just a little bit. And so, um, where is it? Here it is. So there we go. So now we have, we have the formula that we assume is true, and we have the formula that we want to show. So this formula is true, and we want to show this, this one, right? So how do we do that? Right, and so how, how do we go from one to the other? So it's, it's a little bit confusing, perplexing the first time that you see this kind of stuff, but I think that the, 
the way that I think about it here is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to realize, right, realize that the sum from 1 to k plus 1 is the sum from 1 to k plus the term at k plus 1. So let me show you what I mean by that. What I mean by that is that this summation here is actually equal to, right, it's equal to the sum up to k, uh, like this, plus k plus 1, like, like, let's see, where, where did it, where did it go? Oh my god, I put it, <laughs> okay, it really put it far this time. That's the only problem with this thing. I really hate how it does that. But anyway, here. So the sum from 1 to k plus 1 is equal to the sum from 1 to k plus the term at k plus 1, which is just k plus 1. So what we can do is we can actually say, OK, now we see that this side of this summation here um, is equal to uh, this thing over here. And then the good news is, right, the good news is that we know something about this term, right? So we know something about this term. Let me draw an error to the term, right? We know something about this one, right? And so what do we know about that, right? We know that there's it's the only thing we're allowed to be, you know, to assume. It's the one thing that we know is that this is true, right? So we know the inductive hypothesis. So we try to stick the inductive hypothesis in, right? So we replace this sum from k1 to k with this already uh, summed up formula like this. So let's do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, uh, the sum from k i to k plus 1 is equal to, and so what we're going to get is the frac of k k plus 1 divided by 2. Nope. Um, two like this. Let's uh, do it. So here we go. So at this point, we have applied the inductive hypothesis, right? We've used the thing that we are allowed to know, right? So we've used the thing that we are allowed to know and assume. So really, at this point, everything else should just be algebra. OK? And so, so once we do, uh, once we use the inductive hypothesis, generally, we don't have to use the inductive hypothesis multiple, well, we shouldn't say that. We shouldn't have to use it like over and over and over in like every other step of the proof. What we will have to do sometimes is use it multiple times, but we don't have to use it generally in multiple places in the proof. So once we've used the inductive hypothesis, then we just try our best to do some algebra, right? And so here we basically just have to simplify this k times k plus 1 over 2 plus k plus 1. So my hint to you, I think what I would do personally is I would just factor out the uh, Right, I'd factor out the k plus 1. And then what we get is, um, what do we get? We get uh, k over 2 plus 1, like this. And then the next thing that we get, of course, it's stuck here for some reason. Um, OK, let's try that again. But anyway, so after we do that, so ignore this plus sign. That's a typo. Um, so we see that we factor this out. We get uh, we get this term here. So k times k plus one, or k plus one times k over two plus one, and then what we have to do is some kind of you know combination here. So what we have to do is basically say that this is equal to k plus two over two, right? K over two plus two over two. So we can then say that this whole thing is just equal to uh, k plus 1 times k plus 2 divided by 2. And let's let's watch this, see if this works. Okay. Naughty boy, I took out the uh, took out the brackets. 
Okay, let's hope this, yeah, so this rendered. Now at this point, this is what we got. And so we just have to remember, so at this point you're like, okay, uh, where did we start? All right, Alvaro, can you uh, mute? Unless you have a question. Okay, so where do we start? Uh, okay, so um, so where did we start? We started with this expression here, right? The sum from i is equal to k. This is what we wanted to show. Right? And so we started with this summation here. We broke it down into its parts. We did some algebra, we did some algebra, we did some algebra, and then what comes out is k plus one times k plus two over two. So then we scrolled out with, uh, right, we scroll back up and we say, is this what we want to show? And the answer is yes, this is it. Ah. Uh, I think there's a way to turn, is there a way to turn that on? I forget now. I'm sure there is. Uh, let's, let's Google search that really quick. Okay. All right, let's see here. So it's Okay, well, I'll just try to make it clear where I'm pointing. So um Hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll just drag something around. I'll just drag around this like circle. So basically, um, this is the formula that we wanted to show. Okay, will that will that do it? Let's see, hang on. Uh, stream change windows, let's see. Uh, screens. I think I think that should work. All right, let's see. Okay, I see the mouse now. It should be should be visible. Okay. So, this is one example of an induction. Hopefully everybody is most mostly following. Um I'm going to do another induction, I guess. So first I have to come up with it. I have to think for a second. Um, so the trick to these inductions, maybe you'll actually appreciate it, is that negative one to the, uh, to the like n plus one um, plus negative one to the n is equal to what? Right, so what is negative one to the n plus one plus negative one to the n equal to? So um, yeah, so we gotta pick a pick a mod. Let's say mod five, and so then we'll say what kind of things? So say nine to the n plus one uh, plus say four to the n. Let's 
the heck did it go? Okay, here it is. So, I'm gonna the the thing that I'm gonna say is is that this uh, is divisible uh, by five for all n. Okay, and so this is our new induction proof. So let's just put a little line here to indicate that we are done with the previous one. So as it turns out, all of these types of inductions that, I, that I've ever found in textbooks are all basically this. It's the fact that um, neg uh, 9 and 4 are both negative 1 mod 5. And so if you're willing to believe that, then actually you don't need induction for this. But it's a good, it's a good example of induction. It's a good um, tutorial for induction. So I'm not going for what's uh, the most optimal proof. I'm going for what's a good example of induction. So here, um, so let's uh, try this out. So how do we do an induction? Let's do the base case. So for the base case, I'm just going to pick n is equal to 0. And so for n is equal to 0, we have 9 to the 1 power, which is 9, right? Plus uh, 4 to the 0 power, which is um, 9 plus 1, which is 10. Right, so that's uh, that's divisible by 5, I, I'm pretty sure. So base case satisfied, right? So let's think about the inductive case. So for the induction, we assume that, uh, well, I should actually, I'm actually just going to replace it with the k's again, because I think, I think that's a good way to think about it. So 9 to the k plus 1 plus 4 to the k uh, is going to be divisible by 5, right? But now this k is not equal to n, right? So we have to remember that k is a fixed constant, n is a variable. So now what we're doing is we're, we're proving that uh, 9 to the k plus 2 uh, plus 4 to the k plus 1 is divisible by 5. And I'm just going to use the symbols for that. So let's, let's see. So now this is what we need to show. We need to show this fact here. And so basically, you just read this this line here as uh, five uh, divides nine to the k plus two uh, plus four to the k plus one. So that's how you that's how you read that line. It's a little bit of number theory terminology. This little bar here, but I don't care. It's it's uh, it uses it's it's quick. It's easy. There we go. So this is what we know is true right? This is true. And this is WTS, which is want to show. Okay. So that is how we do this induction. So how are we going to handle the induction? So what we do is we say, all right, we have to mess around with this uh, nine to the K plus two plus four to the K plus one business until we get to something that looks like this. Right, because if you get to something like this, what you're assuming is that this thing is already equal to five times some integer j, right? So this thing is equal to five times j. This thing here is equal to God knows what. So we have to play around with it. So now this is the this is the this is the step in proofs that I think everybody, including myself, it's this is the most difficult part of a proof. This is the play step, right? And so the thing is that what you have to do is you have to kind of play around with it. Now I know how to play around with these, um, so so as it turns out, it shouldn't be too hard for me. But I, let's let's not let's wait until I actually do it before I, I proclaim it to be easy, because then of course I could say something stupid. Uh, 
And so you, what you have to do is you have to split off one of the terms on each one of these. So you have to pull off a 9 and you pull off a 4. And so you might be like, well, why do I know to do that? And the answer is because all of the inductions in this class are either going to be based on data structures or they're going to be based on inductions you've seen before. So this is what's called the add zero trick. Or actually, I don't think we even have to use the add zero trick. This is, it's hard to say what kind of trick this is. This trick is called the nine is equal to uh, four plus five trick. I'm sure that if any of you have had me in discrete, you remember this being uh, one of the things that that people love to hate. So you might say, well, how did you know that we want to pull off a nine and pull off a four? And the answer is, I don't, right? I, I technically, you know, if I'm coming at this uh, as, you know, blank slate tabula rasa, I don't know that I have to do this. But what I do know is that I want this expression, right? I want a nine to the k plus one, and I got a nine to k plus one right here, and I want a four to the k, and I got a four to the k here. But then, of course, you're going to say something like, well, I'll, I, you're fine, right? I believe everything you just said. The only problem is that, you know, what's the problem? So the problem is you can't just divide this, right? Because there's a nine here and there's a four here. It doesn't match, right? So you can't just factor out like a nine to the K plus one uh, plus a four to the K. You can't do that. Right, that would be a violation of algebra. So, okay. So we have to do one more trick step. The trick step is we convert this nine right here into four plus five. So let me show you uh, how that works. Like this. And then what we do, is, let's see. How you doing, little expression? Come here. So we do this. And you might say, well, how did you know to do that? To which I say, well, I desperately want to factor out a nine to the K and a, a nine to the K plus one and plus a four to the K. I want to factor that out. Now I can't factor it out from here because there's a nine attached here and there's a four attached here. So it's not good. These don't match. So you can't just factor things out. But if we do this and then we split this up. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to say that this is equal to four times 9 to the k plus 1. And then we're going to say that it's also equal to 5 times 9 to the k plus 1. And then we're going to say it's, you know, uh, let's see. I think, is that it? Let's see. Let's see if that works or if that dies, right? Um, let's see what this looks like. Okay, well, it also, it died for other reasons. So let's let's see if we can make this work. Okay, there we go. So here we see kind of a good result. Finally, right after some tricks. Um, we see here that we have a four times nine to the k plus one and we have a four to the k. So we can actually group these together now, right? We wanna group this term and this term together. So we wanna group them together. And the reason why we wanna group them together is because once we factor out that four and we just have a nine to the k plus one plus a four to the k, then you can basically remember that that was our original assumption. We assumed that 5 divides that thing, and then the only thing we have to show is that 5 divides this, right? So we need 5 to divide this term here. That's terrible. Let's actually draw a circle around it. No fill. We need 5 to divide this, but then the good news is you say, wait a second. I think 5 already divides that. Uh, because there's uh, a 5 attached, right? 
I don't I don't know if I mean so I know because nine is just equal to three times three and three is never divisible by five five is never divisible by three because they're separate primes but technically if that were just X right you don't know uh, if five maybe divides X to the K plus one or not but you know that five divides five so that's that's how to attack this term. And then once you group these other two terms together, what you get to say is that, aha, uh, right, yeah, oh no, okay, good. What you get to say is, aha, but then the other two terms are divisible by five because of the uh, inductive hypothesis, right? Because of the inductive hypothesis. And so that is the kind of moral of the story for induction, right? So when you do induction, you might say, I didn't know, and then uh, let's just let's just say, does the, are we done? And the answer is, yes, we're done. Because we've shown that this thing is equal to these three terms, these two terms together are divisible by 5. This term is already divisible by 5. And so the proof is complete. Um, so you don't use this in projects, obviously. You never use, you don't use induction in code. Um, induction is used for the theory of computer science. So the next example is something I'm going to do, uh, which should prove a little bit of the use of induction for CS. Okay, so I'll do another example. I mean, so the real reason that you want to do induction is because, well, I won't say that. Um, so what I always would tell people uh, about induction is that induction is what you do uh, when you don't understand what's happening. And what I mean by that is that induction is kind of a process that gives you a certain proof. That proof may or may, may not be the best proof, but in terms of being understandable, but it will get you from the start to the end and it's basically like a it's like a cookie cutter approach to proving things. Um, if you truly understood what is happening at like a fundamental level of the division, so remember that this thing here is actually just negative one to the n plus one plus negative one to the n, which is always equal to zero. And so if you just mod off your thing by five, you would actually get that you would you don't even need to do induction. But the reason why we do induction here is because we don't understand enough number theory to just do that. Um, and so let me show you an example in computer science where you might need to use induction. This is something that I like to put on tests and quizzes and stuff. One of my favorite inductions. So we don't know what binary search trees are, but here's an example. Um, we're going to prove that a full, uh, let's just say perfect binary search tree of height h is, or has, 2 to the, I think it's, uh, is it, well, it depends. Uh, 2 to the h minus 1 nodes. It depends on, it's either 2 to the h or 2 to the h plus 1. It depends on on how you count heights in a BST. So we haven't gotten to BSTs yet. That's like next week. But uh, this is this is an inductive proof about binary search trees. So let's, so let me explain what a binary search tree is. A binary search tree, well, let, let's not even worry about a binary search tree. Let's just talk about a binary tree. A binary tree is a tree meaning that uh, in computer science what a tree means is that there's no cycles and so let me show you what I mean. Um, here is a, an example of a binary tree. Uh, if I can draw it pretty good. So basically here is the we don't call it the head node anymore we call it the root node and then each root node has a left child and a right child. So for instance, this 
this is an example of a tree. But then you could also have uh, something like this. And let me just keep this as a little bit of, you could also have this where the left child then has a left and right child. Uh, you could also have something like this where I think I need to kind of, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> they're going to overlap. Let me do this instead. So this is a binary tree, okay? But it's not a perfect binary tree. So the question that you might ask is, what is a, so a binary tree uh, is a tree where each node has a left and right child. Um, the children can be null. So it's totally possible that you have uh, a, you have a left and a right child, but it's also possible that the children could be null. So for instance, this is also a binary tree, even though this, this guy here, his left child is this, but his right child is just a null pointer. Um, here, the left and right child children are both null pointers. Here, left and right are both null pointers. Um, so this is an example of a binary tree. But I haven't told you what a perfect binary tree is. So a perfect binary tree is a binary tree where all of the leaves are at the same level. I think that's the best way to say it. So let me show you what a perfect binary tree looks like. So this is not a perfect one because, uh, and so you might be asking, well, what's a leaf? A leaf is the last node whose children are both null, right? So if you have a node whose children are both null, then this is a leaf here. Um, this is another leaf here, this is another leaf here, etc. Okay. So, but that's not a perfect binary tree, and the reason why is because leaves are at different levels, um, right? Because this, this right node here uh, is also a leaf, right? This node is not really a leaf because it has a child, but it's also not completely an internal node because it has a null pointer. It's kind of half a leaf, right? If you want to call it that or something like that. But anyway, the point is, who cares? Um, let me show you what a perfect binary search or binary tree looks like. I always say search, um, but I don't always mean it. So here is a perfect tree. Let's do a perfect tree. You have to move this even further out. Okay, and then uh, it's still not perfect. It still needs uh, still needs some extra leaves on the base level. I guess who's, all the leaves are at the same level um, and each node has two or zero children, right? Because technically here all the leaves are at the same level, but these nodes have one child, so not perfect. So this is the perfect shape for a binary tree. And you'll understand when we talk about binary trees later why we would want to call this like the perfect, you know. It's also basically from, it's a little bit of a, a steal from mathematics too about, you know, using the term perfect for certain things. Um, but anyway, so here's a perfect, and of course I didn't draw it perfectly, but here's a, uh, this is a perfect tree. And the only thing we have left to decide, we have to decide uh, what is the height of this tree? So if we're computer scientists and a lot of people might count this as height equals to zero, or you could say, well, maybe it's height equal to one, right? And so the question is like, which is it? And the answer is there's no real preference in computer science. It just depends on, um, the decisions made by like, for instance, each textbook makes different decisions as to whether this is height zero or height one. It, it really is just, there's not a perfect, 
Huh. There's not any fixed way to decide. So let's see how many nodes this tree has. So it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So this tree has 15 nodes. Hmm. So I'm saying that's 2 to the h minus 1 nodes. So in this case, h is going to be 4, right? And so what that means is that I am selecting uh, this one over here. This is, this is what I'm picking. I guess I'm not picking this one. So if, if you pick this one, then it's h plus 1 minus 1, right? I'm saying it has 2 to the h minus 1 nodes. That's correct if you do this scheme here, right? Over here, this would be 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1 nodes. And again, you can almost, so what, if you're looking at a textbook for data structures, you can almost tell uh, which one it decides based on this proof. You can just look through the book until you find this proof, and then you can say, ah, uh, height 0 or height 1. Um, it really doesn't matter. It does change the formula, but you see that it doesn't really change the formula in a meaningful way. It just shifts the formula by one. Okay, so uh, so basically, how do we do the base case? So I'm assuming, so here's the base case. Um, so you have two base cases, either a null tree, which is height equals to zero, because this is height equals to one. So if the height is equal to zero of a null tree, two to the zero minus one is equal to zero. So there's no nodes. That's good. And maybe you think that's a bit of a cheat. So h equals 1. Uh, that's a, we're doing a different base case. And remember, you only have to do one base case. But if you think that this one is a little bit cheaty, if you think this one isn't getting to the point, then maybe you do a different base case. You do uh, h equals 1. So basically, you have a tree with one node. If a tree has one node, then that node is the root. And that's it. Right? There's only one thing in the tree. And so is that equal to 2 to the uh, 1 minus 1, which is equal to 2 minus 1, which is equal to 1 nodes? Yes. So base case done. All right, so that's, that's basically, um, and you see why I started with the mathematical examples first. So the thing about computer science, the thing about doing any kind of induction where you have to actually use a data structure is that you have to learn about that data structure first. And so we'll learn about trees in a separate lecture, but here we're just going to do this inductive proof because I think it's a pretty good proof, pretty useful thing. Um, so basically, now let's assume for height h equals k, or yeah, h equals k, that uh, there are 2 to the k minus one nodes in that perfect tree. Okay. So if there's two to the k minus one nodes in that perfect tree, then our question is, what about height h equals k plus one, right? Well, there would need to be, there would need to be two to the k plus one minus one uh, nodes. So the question is, are there? So basically the way this induction works is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a tree. And here what we're going to do is uh, I think we can make cornice equals 3, make a triangle like this. Oh, perfect. And then I can copy paste it like this. So we have two triangles that are going to represent trees. So we're going to assume that this is a perfect tree of height uh, k plus 1, right? So we're going to assume this is a perfect tree of height k plus 1. And then what we're going to say is, what do we know about these subtrees? Right, what do we know about these subtrees? So we know that this subtree here, this is a perfect tree of height k, right? So these are both perfect trees of height k. 
right? Because the, the total one is a perfect tree of height k plus 1. These subtrees are perfect trees of height k. So if the height is equal to k, guess what we get to do? Now, for k plus 1, we don't get to do this. But for height is equal to k, we know that there's 2 to the k uh, minus 1 nodes. So what we know is that is this. We know that there are two trees of height k. So a tree of height k plus a tree of height k plus the root right, is equal to 2 to the k minus 1 plus 2 to the k minus 1 plus 1, because the root is a single node that's not in either of these subtrees. So I think I, here we go. So this is what we get. We get, I'm using t of k to represent um, the number of nodes. t of k equals number of nodes in a perfect tree of height k. Right, so this is the number of nodes in a perfect tree of height k. And so basically, um, what should I say about this? Right, so here we have the number of uh, nodes in height k, number of nodes in a perfect tree of height k, and we use the inductive hypothesis twice, right? Where we say 2 to the k minus 1 plus 2 to the k minus 1 plus 1 because the root is a separate node. The good news here is that this plus 1 cancels out with one of these minus 1s. And then the other thing we know is that 2 to the k plus 2 to the k uh, minus 1 is equal to 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. And uh, at that point, we get to say proof complete, right? So I think that this is a great little proof. The nice thing about this proof is that, and the reason why computer science proofs tend to be a little bit nicer than the math proofs, is that uh, we can basically say QED here, which you know stands for quid. Uh, was to be demonstrated. It's an old kind of thing that people used to just slam onto the end of proofs back when all, all things were written in Latin. Uh, people still hit things with QEDs. Sometimes, sometimes what you see at the end of proofs nowadays is just a little box. And that denotes that the proof is over. Uh, if you miss something, go back, right? Um, you, usually they want to say that the proof is over because now I'm about to say more things and, and these things are not part of the proof. So uh, the reason why computer science proofs are usually kind of nicer um, uh, using induction, the reason is because normally uh, you should draw a picture. Right, so in this case, you're, we're just drawing a picture here, right? We know that every tree has a left child and a right child or every root of a tree has a left child and a right child those roots can either have subtrees of their own. And so we can apply the inductive hypothesis to those perfect subtrees. And then what we get is uh, one little mathematical expression. All we have to do is just add 2 to the k plus 2 to the k, get 2 to the k plus 1, simplify all the plus 1s and minus 1s, and we're done. So, so this is an example of computer science proof uh, using induction. And um, let's do one more computer science proof, and then maybe that'll be it for the lecture today. And then, uh, we won't cover big O today, so uh, we're just going to cover, you know, other th induction. And that's fine, because I think, I think that the thing is that uh, it's, it's always worth it to cover induction. So we're going to talk about graphs later, but for now... Um, a graph is a bunch of nodes connected uh, by edges. So you can call them vertices, edges, you can call them nodes, uh, lines, edges, whatever, right? So vertices are nodes connected by lines, edges, uh, connections, roads, who cares, right? So a graph is like a tree, except that it is connected by, uh, you know, a bunch of 
So here's an example of a graph. So actually, there's even a nice little graph right here we can try to reproduce. So here's a graph. It's not a complete graph, and I'll tell you what a complete graph is in a second. So graphs are extremely important in computer science for things like uh, AI, for things like, um, well, just, I mean, algorithms and AI and searching and the internet is one big graph and all kinds of things. So, I mean, graphs, the applications, it's, it's hard to even limit the applications for graphs, really. And the fact that all trees are actually graphs. They're just special graphs. So this is more or less the, the, the graph that is, is displayed here. So here's an example of a graph. But it's not a complete graph. So let me tell you what a complete graph is. A complete graph is a graph where each node has a connection to each other node. All right, so let's make something like that. I think, yeah, I think there's like a, is there an evenly, um, I think we could basically just try to do something like this. Let me try to draw a complete graph of, let's do K4 first. So complete graphs are, are usually denoted as K. Let's see here. Okay, uh, so it is it is pushing them together where I don't want that to happen. Um, that's unfortunate. Oh well. So here we are. So here's K4. Here's an example of a complete graph. It's a graph where all of these four nodes are connected, but this does not make it a complete graph. This is actually not a complete graph. And the reason why is because this node and this node aren't connected, this node and this node aren't connected. Now this is a complete graph. We would call this uh, K4, is the complete graph on four nodes. So let's draw K5. So K5 is more like a pentagon. Let's see if I can do a good pentagon. First I should delete all of these edges here. And here is Good enough, good enough, not bad, not bad. So let's draw K5. So K5, the first thing you do is you connect them around the edges. That's that's the easiest thing to do. And then remember, every node has to be connected to every other node. So uh, this node is already connected to this node, but it's not connected to this one, and it's not connected to this one, right? Um, so, okay, now it's connected to all of them. But this node isn't connected to here, and what I mean by connected, I don't just mean connected through a path, I mean directly connected. So you have to do this, and then this node here is not yet connected to here, and then at this point we're actually, I, I'm pretty sure I know we're done, and just because we made this star pattern. Um, so now every node is connected to every other node. So this is K5. Okay, that's right. So we're about to induct on the number of connections. And actually, we've already done a similar proof. It's, it's the same thing as the first induction proof. Uh, it turns out to be n choose 2, which is also equal to n times n plus 1 divided by 2, which is also equal to the sum from 1 to n of um, i. <laughs> so, uh, so, so this is a famous, these are all kind of interrelated mathematical facts. So let's count the number, uh, the number of edges on K4. Let's let's do K1, K2, K3, K4, K5. So you might say, well, we haven't drawn K1. Here's K1. Here's K2. Uh, K2 is this thingy, like a, I guess a helium or you know, or uh, whatever. And then let's draw K3. K3 is three nodes. These are pretty simple, which is why I didn't start out with them. 
and they don't kind of get the point across very well because you might see, oh, uh, all of these are connected, but the problem is that even though all of them are connected, um, if you add another node, you cannot just do it with, with like a circle around the edges connections. You have to do some cross connections too. So, okay. So this is a K1, this is a K2. Uh, normally they're subscripts, but I'm, I'm too lazy to do the subscripts for them because that would just, that would double all the time that we're taking right here. So K1, K2, K3, right? We're gonna count the number of edges. So K1 has zero edges because, cool. K2 has one edge because that's what I count. Um, K3 has three edges. How many edges does K4 have? K4 has one, two, three, four, five, six. Hmm. Hmm. Six. And how many does K5 have? One, two, three, four, five around the edges. Then one, two, three, four. This one goes back five. So there are 10 here. So if you remember back to uh, when you learned about permutations and combinations, hopefully in 203, 1, 3, 6, 10. That sounds remarkably familiar, right? So if you ask yourself the question, like what is, um, five choose two, right? So that's equal to uh, five factorial over two factorial, three factorial. Oops, uh, I made a mistake somewhere. Where did I, where did I screw up? Did they not have choice? Interesting, what did I mess up? Oh, I think maybe I need an extra set of brackets. We'll see in just a second if this works. No. Okay. Oh, 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 that's why. Syntax error. Does not compute. Please, come on. You know better than that. Okay. So if we look at 5 choose 2, as it turns out, 5 choose 2 is equal to 5 times 4 divided by 2. So it's equal to 20 divided by 2. So this is equal to 10. Right? So this is equal to 10. And so you might think, well, what is 4 choose 2? Well, 4 choose 2 is 4 times 3, which is 12 divided by 2, 6. What's 3 choose 2? 3 times 2 divided by 2, which is 3. What's 2 choose 2? 1. And what's, well, I guess 1 choose 2 is 0 because it's, uh, it's kind of an undefined thing. So, all right, cool, weird, right? And so you notice that... Um, the number of nodes is actually equal to uh, n times n minus 1 divided by 2, which is also equal to uh, n choose 2, as it turns out. And so this is, this is a famous problem. It's actually called the handshake problem. Um, oh, Lord. Uh, let's do that again. Because if you think about it, the number of ah crap, the number of handshakes of n people in a room is actually n choose two. So let's delete all of that and okay. So fair enough. Okay, so how do we prove this? So we're going to prove it by induction really quick. We're going to do a five minute proof by induction. So here's the base case. Uh, n equals zero. We're gonna say that uh, k1 has k1 has uh, zero edges because I can count them. 
Um, and the reason why that's correct is because uh, 0 choose 2 is 0. Right? It's also equal to, say, 0 times negative 1 divided by 2, which is equal to 0. So either way, it's fine. So that's the base case. Again, you might say I'm cheating, but if you say I'm cheating, then go up to, or I'm sorry, I started at n equals 1. If you think I'm cheating about this, then go up to k, k2. All right, go up to k2, and you say k2 has one edge, and that is 2 choose 1, or 2 choose 2, so that should also work. So now we're going to assume uh, that this works for uh, all the way up to k sub k, right? Which is the complete graph on k nodes. And so now what we're going to do is we are going to construct the complete graph um, on k plus 1 nodes out of the complete graph on k nodes. So this is how I'm going to do it. So remember, we can make a graph. So pretend that this is not just k5. Pretend that this is k on, this is the complete graph on some number of nodes. Who knows how many, right? This is the complete graph on some number k of nodes. So this is how I'm going to make the complete graph on that number of nodes plus one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add another node here, and then I'm going to connect it to all of the other nodes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect it here. I'm going to connect it here. I'm going to connect it maybe like here, like that. I'm going to connect it like this. And I'm going to connect it like like this. And so we have this like, this is not like the preferred way to draw this, but this is definitely uh, the complete graph on six nodes now because we have this node that connects to each one of the previous nodes. So, so what was the process here? Right, the process was make a new node and then add that many edges, right? Or I shouldn't say that many. Add k more edges. And so we're right back to the same proof that we had before, where what we do is we say, uh, if the old one has k times k minus one divided by two nodes, and we add on another k of them, then we factor out the k as we did before, and then we're left with um, we're left with k minus 1 over 2 uh, plus 1. And so hopefully all of this compiles. We're very close to the end. I have, I'm going to maybe steal one minute of extra time. Uh, that <laughs> did not render at all. The k's all turned into plus signs for some reason. Um, So basically, now we have to do just a little bit of algebra. Oh my goodness. Come on. Render correctly, please. I don't know why it renders so badly. Um, it really doesn't always like me. Where'd it go? Let's try one last time. I really just need this expression to pop up. Here it is. All right, now it's rendering them as Ks. I'm about to give up. Um, First, it does them all as plus signs. OK, it's really fighting me. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to just do it in text. I'm going to say k times k minus 1 over 2 plus k is equal to k factored out times k, over, k minus 1 over 2 uh, plus 1. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do the exact same thing we did before. We're going to make this 2 over 2. And then we're going to say that this is k times uh, k minus 1 plus, uh, so now it's plus 2, so here this is going to be k plus 1 uh, over 2, and so now we just have to make sure that that's the right thing, right? Is that the right thing when you replace, is that right when you replace k with k plus 1 in k times k minus 1 
over 2? And the answer is yes, because you do a k plus 1 times k plus 1 minus 1 all divided by 2. That's equal to k plus 1 times k divided by 2. So it's in a different order. The k is in a different order, but they're equal expressions. So the answer is yes. So what we've just done is we've proved that uh, in a room with n people, if each person has to shake the hand of every other person, then there are exactly uh, n times n minus 1 divided by 2 handshakes. So you can, you can say that the complete graph on k nodes has k choose 2 nodes. You can say that the number of handshakes in a room with n people is n times n minus 1 over 2, right? These are all equivalent statements, and we've proved it with induction, right? Um, so what we're pretending here, so we pretend uh, that this is k, k, not just k5, right? It's hard to draw k, k because you don't know how, exactly how many nodes to put in, and it's a little hard to draw. So I'm just, I'm just sticking on a k5 here to make a k6. But you see that there's no difference here. If this were k17 and we were making k18, it would be the exact same process. It would just be a lot more lines. Um, so that's, that's how to prove this. And, and you notice that both of these computer science proofs used pictures, which is, isn't that nice? I think that's nice. OK, so I think that's all for today. Uh, hopefully, we learned something. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we did. Maybe we didn't. So I'll post these. I'll save it and post them. And then we'll do Big O next time. And I will. I'm, I'm working on uh, potentially getting a new internet service uh, Saturday or Monday. So maybe by Tuesday we'll be either back to live streams on Google or whatever. I I'm glad that everybody is here. I'm, I hope that no one else was shot out. Um, okay. Yeah, so if you didn't understand all the, the details about the data structures, uh, you have not been taught trees, you have not been taught graphs. We're just using them as induction examples. Okay, so that's really it. I'm going to let everybody go. Have a good rest of your day. That's all. Oh yes, and this video will be reposted on YouTube. Uh, I will end the video now so that um, I, you know, if I can find OBS, I can.